This is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter, 2022. Welcome to Lesson 9, Jesus the Perfect Sacrifice, ready for teaching on February 26. It's from the series In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews. The author is Dr. Felix Cortez, who is Associate Professor of New Testament Literature in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And I'm your reader for today, Dr. Percy Harold. Uh, Sabbath afternoon, February 19. Uh, before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we study this week's lesson, which is all about the lovely Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, that not only will our love grow greater for him, but that we may see how that historically and theologically and biblically, this is such a great truth for us to be aware of, that Jesus came and lived and died, that each of us could have eternal life and that he's ready there now to be with us and to help us. And as we read about so many things in his life and in the life of your people in the past, we pray that your Spirit will guide us and bless us as we open your Word. And today I'd like to pray for listeners in Auckland, New Zealand, in Nukalofa, in Tonga, in Cairo, in Egypt, in Kuang Chau, in China, in uh, Buenos Aires, in Argentina, in Helsinki, in Finland, in Singapore, and in the great state of Arkansas in the United States. Lord, as each of us opens your word this week, May we walk closer to Jesus, we pray in his dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Let's read that again, Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. The idea that a man found guilty and executed on a cross should be worshipped as God was offensive to the ancient mind. Sparse reference to the cross in Roman literature shows their aversion to the idea. For the Jews, the law declared that a man impaled on a tree was cursed by God. As you would read in Deuteronomy 21 verse 23, His body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Thus, the first motifs that we find in the Christian paintings of the catacombs with a peacock supposedly symbolising immortality, a dove, the athlete's victory palm, and the fish. Later, other themes appeared, Noah's Ark, Abraham sacrificing the ram instead of Isaac, Daniel in the lion's den, Jonah being spit out by the fish, a shepherd carrying a lamb, or depictions of such miracles as the healing of the paralytic and the raising of Lazarus. These were symbols of salvation, victory and care. The cross, on the other hand, conveyed a sense of defeat and shame. Yet it was the cross that became the emblem of Christianity. In fact, Paul simply called the gospel the word of the cross in 1 Corinthians 1, 18. Let's read the whole verse. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This week, we will look at the cross as it appears in the book of Hebrews. Sunday, February 20. Why were sacrifices needed? Hebrews 9.15 explains that the death of Jesus as a sacrifice had the purpose of providing redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, in order that the people of God might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance, we read in the NASB. 
In the ancient Near East, a covenant between two persons or nations was a serious matter. It involved an exchange of promises under oath. It implied the assumption that the gods would punish those who broke the oath. Often, these covenants were ratified through the sacrifice of an animal. For example, when God made a covenant with Abraham, the ceremony involved cutting animals in half in Genesis 15, 6-21, which we'll read later. The parties would walk between the parts as an acknowledgement that those animals represented the fate of the party who broke the covenant. Significantly, only God walked between the animals for the purpose of communicating to Abraham that he would not break his promise. Compare Genesis 15, 6-21 and Jeremiah 34, 8-22. What do these texts teach about the covenant? First of all, Genesis 15, beginning at verse 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. For he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle, and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and, behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions." Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, and the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And we'll compare that with Jeremiah 34, verses 8 to 22. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people who were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty to them, that every man should set free his male and female slave, a Hebrew man or woman, that no one should keep a Jewish brother in bondage. Now, when all the princes and all the people who had entered into the covenant heard that every one should set free his male and female slaves, that no one should keep them in bondage any more, they obeyed and let them go. But afterward they changed their minds and made the male and female slaves return, whom they had set free, and brought them into subjection as male and female slaves. Therefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, saying, At the end of seven years let every man set free his Hebrew brother, who has been sold to him, and when he has served you six years, you shall let him go free from you. But your fathers did not obey me, nor incline their ear. Then you recently turned and did what was right in my sight, every man proclaiming liberty to his neighbour, and you made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. Then you turned around and profaned my name, and every one of you brought back his male and female slaves, whom you had set at liberty, at their pleasure, and brought them back into subjection to be your male and female slaves. Therefore thus says the Lord, You have not obeyed me in proclaiming liberty, 
every one to his brother and every one to his neighbour. Behold, I proclaim liberty to you, says the Lord, to the sword, to pestilence and to famine, and I will deliver you to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth, and I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me, when they cut the calf in two and passed between the parts of it, the princes of Judah, the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf, I will give them into the hand of their enemies, and into the hand of those who seek their life. Their dead bodies shall be for meat for the birds of the heaven and the beasts of the earth. And I will give Zedekiah king of Judah and his princes into the hand of their enemies, into the hand of those who seek their life, and into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which has gone back from you. Behold, I will command, says the Lord, and cause them to return to this city. They will fight against it, and take it, and burn it with fire, and I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant." The covenant with God gave Israel access to the promised land as their inheritance. It involved, however, a set of commandments and the sprinkling of blood upon an altar. This sprinkling implied the destiny of the party who broke the covenant. This is why Hebrews says that, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins in Hebrews 9.22. That's a literal translation. When Israel broke the covenant, God faced a painful dilemma. The covenant demanded the death of the transgressors, but God loved his people. If God should simply look the other way or refuse to punish the transgressors, his commandments would never be enforceable, and this world would descend into chaos. The Son of Man, however, offered himself as a substitute. He died in our place so that we may receive the promised eternal inheritance. We read in Hebrews 9, 15 and 26. Let's read those two verses. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. And verse 26, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And Romans 3, verses 21 to 26, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That is, he was going to uphold the sanctity of his law while at the same time saving those who broke the law. And he could do this only through the cross. And so to finish the day, how can we see here why the law is so central to the gospel message? Monday, February 21, Diverse Kinds of Sacrifices Jesus' death provided forgiveness or remission for our sins. The remission of our sins, however, involves much more than the cancellation of the penalty for our transgression of the covenant. It involves other elements just as important. That is why the Israelite sacrificial system had five different kinds of sacrifices. Each was necessary to express the richness of the meaning of the cross of Christ. 
read Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 19, what was the prayer request of Paul in behalf of believers? Ephesians 3, beginning at verse 14, For this reason I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length, and depth, and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The Holocaust offering, or burnt offering, required that the whole animal be consumed on the altar, in Leviticus chapter 1. It represented Jesus, whose life was consumed for us. Expiation required Jesus' total commitment to us. Even though he was equal with God, Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, we read in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. And now seems a good time to read that passage which occurs in every series of Adult Bible Study Guide Sabbath School Lessons. Philippians 2, beginning at verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. The grain offering was a gift of gratitude for God's provision of sustenance for his people, and it's described in Leviticus chapter 2. It also represents Jesus, the bread of life, as we read in John six thirty-five to 48 through whom we have eternal life. Let's read those two verses, John six thirty-five, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And verse 48, I am the bread of life. The peace or fellowship offering implied a communal meal with friends and family to celebrate the well-being provided by God, and we find that in Leviticus chapter 3. It represented Christ, whose sacrifice provided peace for us, as we read in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And Romans 5 verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Ephesians 2 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. It also emphasizes that we need to participate in Jesus' sacrifice by eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood, as you read in John six, fifty one to fifty six. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any one eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarrelled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. The sin or purification offering provided expiation for sins, and we read about that in Leviticus chapter 4 and 5. This sacrifice emphasized the role of the blood of the animal, which represented its life to provide redemption from sins and pointed forward to the blood of Jesus who redeems us from our sins. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. 
For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And Matthew twenty six twenty eight. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And Romans three twenty five whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. And Hebrews 9.14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The guilt or reparation offering described in Leviticus 5.14 to chapter 6 verse 7 provided forgiveness in cases where reparation or restitution was possible. It tells us that God's forgiveness does not free us from the responsibility to provide reparation or restitution where possible to those whom we have wronged. Let's read that, Leviticus 5, beginning at verse 14. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, If a person commits a trespass and sins unintentionally in regard to the holy things of the Lord... Then he shall bring to the Lord as his trespass offering a ram without blemish from the flocks, with your valuation in shekels of silver according to the shekel of the sanctuary as a trespass offering. And he shall make restitution for the harm that he has done in regard to the holy thing, and shall add one-fifth to it and give it to the priest. So the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering, and it shall be forgiven him." If a person sins and commits any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he does not know it, yet he is guilty and shall bear it his iniquity. And he shall bring to the priest a ram without blemish from the flock, with your valuation as a trespass offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him regarding his ignorance in which he erred, and did not know it, and it shall be forgiven him. It is a trespass offering. He has certainly trespassed against the Lord." And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, If a person sins and commits a trespass against the Lord by lying to his neighbour about what was delivered to him for safekeeping, or about a pledge, or about a robbery, or if he has extorted from his neighbour, or if he has found what was lost and lies concerning it and swears falsely, in any one of these things that a man may do in which he sins, then it shall be, because he has sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore what he has stolen, or the thing which he has extorted, or what was delivered to him for safekeeping, or the lost thing which he found, or all that about which he has sworn falsely. He shall restore its full value, add one-fifth more to it, and give it to whomever it belongs on the day of his trespass offering. And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord, a ram without blemish from the flock, with your valuation, as a trespass offering to the priest. So the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord, and he shall be forgiven for any one of these things that he may have done in which he trespasses. It tells us that God's forgiveness does not free us from the responsibility to provide reparation or restitution where possible to those whom we have wronged. The sanctuary sacrifices teach us that the experience of salvation is more than just accepting Jesus as our substitute. We also need to feed on him, share his benefits with others, and provide reparation to those whom we have wronged. Tuesday, February 22, Jesus' Perfect Sacrifice Read Hebrews 7.27 and Hebrews 10.10 How is Jesus' sacrifice described in these passages? Hebrews 7.27 
who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. And chapter 10, verse 10, By that will we have been sacrificed through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The Levitical priests, who were many in numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, we read in Hebrews 7.23, are contrasted with Jesus who lives forever and has an eternal priesthood, as we read in Hebrews 7 verses 24 and 25. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Levitical priests daily in Hebrews 7.27 and every year in Hebrews 9.25 offered gifts and sacrifices that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshipper. We read in Hebrews 9 verse 9, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. And Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 to 4, for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshippers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Jesus, however, offered himself once for all, a single sacrifice, as we read before in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. And we also read about it in Hebrews 10, verses 12 to 14. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That uh, cleanses our consciences, as you read in Hebrews 9.14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And Hebrews 10 verses 1 to 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshippers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the the volume of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sins you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law, then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, once for all. And he puts away sin, as we read in Hebrews 9.26. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus' sacrifice is superior to the sacrifice of animals because Jesus was the Son of God, as we read in Hebrews seven twenty six to 28 For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, 
harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected for ever." who perfectly fulfilled God's will, as we read in Hebrews 10, 5-10. The description of the sacrifice of Jesus as having occurred once for all has several important implications. First, Jesus' sacrifice is perfectly effective and never to be surpassed. The sacrifices of the Levitical priests were repeated because they were not effective otherwise. Would they not have ceased to be offered, as it says in Hebrews 10.2, since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? Second, all the different kinds of sacrifices of the Old Testament found their fulfilment at the cross. Thus, Jesus not only cleanses us from sin, as we read in Hebrews 9.14, but he also provides sanctification, as we read in Hebrews 10.10-14, 10 by putting sin away from our lives, as we read in Hebrews 9.26. Let's just check each of those right now. Hebrews 9.14 How much more shall the blood of Christ who, through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And Hebrews 10, 10 to 14. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And Hebrews 9.26, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself." Before the priests could approach God in the sanctuary and minister in behalf of their fellow human beings, they had to be cleansed and sanctified or consecrated. And there's a whole description of that in Leviticus chapter 8 and Leviticus chapter 9. Jesus' sacrifice cleanses us and consecrates us, as we've just read in Hebrews 10, 10 to 14, so that we may approach God with confidence, as we read in Hebrews 10, 9. 19 to 23. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And serve him as a royal priesthood, as we've read in chapter 9, verse 14, but also in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Finally, Jesus' sacrifice also provides nourishment for our spiritual life. It provides an example that we need to observe and follow. Thus, Hebrews invites us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, especially the events of the cross, and follow his lead, as we read in Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 4, and chapter 13, verses 12 and 13. So, Hebrews 12, beginning at verse 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run 
run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And chapter 13, beginning at verse 12, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. And so to finish today, the cross is the basis for all the benefits that God bestows upon us. It provides purification from sin, sanctification to serve, and nourishment to grow. How can we better experience what we have been given in Jesus? Wednesday, February 23, The Cross and the Cost of Forgiveness. Read Hebrews chapter 9, verses 22 to 28. What does this passage say about the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary? Hebrews 9, beginning at verse 22, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another, he then would have had to to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation." The idea that the heavenly sanctuary needs cleansing makes sense in the context of the Old Testament sanctuary. The sanctuary is a symbol of God's government, as we read in 1 Samuel 4, verse 4. And that reads, So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were there with the ark of the covenant of God. And Second Samuel 6 verse 2, And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. And the way God deals with the sin of his people affects the public perception of the righteousness of his government, as we read in Psalm 97, verse 2. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. As ruler, God is the judge of his people, and he is expected to be fair, vindicating the innocent and condemning the guilty. Thus, when God forgives the sinner, he carries judicial responsibility. The sanctuary, which represents God's character and administration, is contaminated. This explains why God bears our sins when he forgives. In Exodus 34, verse 7, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Numbers, chapter 14, verse verses 17 to 19. 
And now, I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. The original Hebrew for forgiving, nos, N-O-S-E, in these verses means carrying or bearing. The system of sacrifices in the Israelite sanctuary illustrated this point. When a person sought forgiveness, he brought an animal as a sacrifice in his behalf, confessed his sins over it, and slaughtered it. The blood of the animal was dubbed upon the horns of the altar or sprinkled before the veil in the temple in the first apartment. Thus the sins were symbolically transferred into the sanctuary. God took the sins of the people and bore them himself. In the Israelite system, cleansing from or atonement for sins occurred in two phases. During the year, repentant sinners brought sacrifices to the sanctuary, which cleansed them from their sin but transferred the sin to the sanctuary, to God himself. At the end of the year, on the Day of Atonement, which was the Day of Judgment, God would cleanse the sanctuary, clearing his judicial responsibility by transferring the sins from the sanctuary to the scapegoat, Azazel, who represented Satan. And we read about that in Leviticus 16, verses 15 to 22. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions, for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, until he comes out, that he may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for all the assembly of Israel. And he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord, and make atonement for it, and shall take some of the blood of the bull, and some of the blood of the goat, and put it on the horns of the altar all around. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it, and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting, and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness." This two-phase system, represented by the two apartments in the earthly sanctuary, which were a pattern of the heavenly sanctuary, as we read in Exodus 25 verse 9 and Hebrews 8 5, permitted God to show mercy and justice at the same time. Exodus 25 verse 9 reads, According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. And Hebrews 8 verse 5, Who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Those who confessed their sins during the year showed loyalty to God by observing a solemn rest and afflicting themselves on the Day of Atonement, as we read in Leviticus 16, verses 29 to 31. This shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, 
On the tenth day of the month you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute for ever. Those who did not show loyalty would be cut off, as we read in Leviticus 23, verses 27 to 32. Also, the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from a among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute for ever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. And so to finish today, think of what you would face if you had to face the just punishment for your sins. How should that truth help you understand what Christ has done for you? Thursday, February 24. Judgment and the Character of God Read Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26, Romans 1, 16 and 17, and Romans 5, verse 8. What does redemption in the cross for the forgiveness of our sins reveal about God? Romans 3, beginning at verse 21, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. And Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The forgiveness of our sins implies two phases in Jesus' mediation in the two apartments of the heavenly sanctuary. First, Jesus removed our sins and carried them himself on the cross in order to provide forgiveness to everyone who believes in him. As we read in Acts 2, 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and saviour, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. On the cross, Jesus won the right to forgive anyone who believes in him because he has carried their sin. He also has inaugurated a new covenant which allows him to put God's law in the heart of believers through the Holy Spirit. As we read in Hebrews chapter 8 verses 10 to 12, 
Hebrews 8, beginning at verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbour, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And Ezekiel 36, beginning at verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. A second phase in the ministry of Jesus consists of a judgment, the pre-advent judgment, which was still future from the point of the view of Hebrews. As you read in Hebrews 2 verses 1 to 4, therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through the angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both through signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. And Hebrews 6 verse 2, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And Hebrews 9 verses 27 to 28, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. And Hebrews 10 verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. This judgment begins with God's people and is described in Daniel 7, 9-27, Matthew 22, 1-14, and Revelation 14, verse 7. Let's look at those texts. Daniel 7, beginning at verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire, a fire a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by, and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me, and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those beasts, which are four, are four kings, which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom, and possess the kingdom for ever, even for ever and ever. Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces, and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows.' 
I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints, and prevailing against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favour of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus, he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings, which shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saint shall be given into his hand for a time, and times, and half a time. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion, to consume and destroy it for ever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. And Matthew 22, beginning at verse 1, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son, and sent out his servants to call those who were in invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him, hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen." and Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Its purpose is to show the righteousness of God in forgiving His people. In this judgment, the records of their lives will be open for the universe to see. God will show what happened in the hearts of the believers and how they embraced Jesus as their Saviour and accepted His Spirit in their lives. Speaking of this judgment, Ellen G. White wrote in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 471 and 72, Man cannot meet these charges himself. In his sin-stained garments, confessing his guilt, he stands before God. But Jesus our Advocate presents an effectual plea in behalf of all who by repentance and faith have committed the keeping of their souls to him. He pleads their cause and vanquishes their accuser by the mighty arguments of Calvary, his perfect obedience to God's Even law unto the death of the cross has given him all power in heaven and in earth, and he claims of his Father mercy and reconciliation for guilty man. But while we should realise our sinful condition, we are to rely upon Christ as our righteousness, our sanctification and our redemption. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf. He is able to silence the accuser with arguments founded not upon our merits, but on his own. And so to finish today, why do the cross and the ministry of Jesus in our behalf suggest that 
we should look confidently, but with humility and repentance, toward the judgment. Friday, February 25. Professor Jerry Moscala has explained the nature of this pre-Advent judgment. God, he writes, in Toward a Biblical Theology of God's Judgment, a celebration of the cross in seven phases of divine universal judgment, published in the Journal of the Adventist Theological Society in spring 2004, page 155, we read, God is not there in order to display my sins like in a shop window. He will, on the contrary, Point, first of all, to his amazing, transforming, powerful grace, and in front of the whole universe, he, as the true witness of my entire life, will explain my attitude toward God, my inner motives, my thinking, my deeds, my orientation and direction of life. He will demonstrate it all. Jesus will testify that I made many mistakes, that I transgressed his holy law, but also that I repented, asked for forgiveness, and was changed by his grace. He will proclaim, My blood is sufficient for the sinner Moscala, his orientation of life is on me, his attitude toward me and other people is warm and unselfish, he is trustworthy, he is my good and faithful servant. End of quote. And then from the book The Desire of Ages, pages 19 and 20, both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. In the light from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven that the love which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God, and that in the meek and lowly one is manifested the character of him who dwelleth in the light which no man can approach to. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. 1. Human beings have always had the tendency to offer different kinds of sacrifices to God as an exchange for forgiveness of salvation. Some offer God heroic acts of penance, long journeys, etc. Others offer a life of service or acts of self-deprivation, etc. How should these acts be considered in the light of Jesus' sacrifice and the assertion of Scripture that the cross has put an end to all sacrifices, as we read in Daniel 9.27 and Hebrews 10, verse 18? First of all, Daniel 9.27, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And Hebrews 10.18, Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering of sin. And question two, at the same time, time, what is the role of sacrifice in the life of the believer? What did Jesus mean when he said that we need to take our cross and follow him? In Matthew 16 and verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Or the Apostle Paul, when he said that we should offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, in Romans 12.1. What is the relationship between the instructions of Jesus in Matthew and Paul in Romans? And Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 13 Verses 15 and 16, Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, but do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased.
Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Gospel Calling and it's by Andrew McChesney. Kamla, the breadwinner of his family, fell ill in rural Laos. His legs became so heavy that he could not walk. He was confined to his house for three months. With no money to see a doctor, Kamla, not his real name, resorted to all sorts of herbal medicine and traditional healers, including the shaman or spirit doctor in his village. Nothing helped. Finally, seeing his desperation, someone told him about a Seventh-day Adventist pastor who would help many people by cell phone. The man called up Pastor Sajua Lee, whose picture appears at the bottom of the page, and asked for help. Now, it wasn't simply a phone call. Phone calls were something of a luxury, costing 700 Laotian kips, that's 8 US cents, per minute. At the time, a third of the population was living on less than US $1.25 a day, and nearly two-thirds were living on less than $2 a day. The ill man begged Pastor Sajua to heal him. I am nobody, the pastor replied. I cannot heal you, but my God, who is called Jesus, can heal you if it is his will. All we have to do is ask him. Kamla requested prayer, and the pastor prayed for him over the phone. The next day, the pastor called the man to offer prayer for him again. Kamla was so excited, I can walk, he explained. Although his legs were weak, he was able to walk for the first time in three months. He had already gone out to work on his farm. Your God is so powerful, he said. How can I worship your God who is called Jesus? The pastor told him that he could and should worship Jesus all the time and added that Jesus had set aside a special day for worship, the seventh day Sabbath. The man agreed to stop work on Sabbath to worship Jesus. Seeing that he lived far from a church, he asked the pastor to help him worship on Sabbaths. That meant that the pastor would have to call every Sabbath. But he didn't mind. If Jesus could provide Kamala with healing, he also would provide the means to pay for the calls. Thank you for your Sabbath school mission offerings that help spread the gospel to people in Laos and other countries of the Southern Asia-Pacific Division, which will receive this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering. This mission story illustrates mission objective number two of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach among unreached and underreached people groups and to non-Christian religions. Learn more at IWillGo2020.org. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.